Before we get started tonight, we're going to do a little exercise to kind of, uh, it's an illustration I need to use later, but I figured this is the best time to do it right now. Sometimes I put a silver coin in here under a chair. <laughs> this just happens to be those type of days that that happened. Okay, this is exactly what I thought would happen. There is one under the chair. 100% silver, bullion coin, worth 30 bucks, roughly. Probably worth 3,000 by next week. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Yeah, okay. Finally, finally, finally. Very good. So just keep this exercise in mind. You keep the coin. But keep it in mind when I come back to it. Last week's message was concerning what? Laying on of hands out of Hebrews 6, which is a foundational part of your walk with Christ. It's, it is, the Bible says elementary. I mean, so we talked about that. Talked about that. Uh, many years ago, we weren't pastoring yet. Drenda asked me to tell this story. Um, back in the day, you know, I've had my financial company for 40 some years and we meet clients. Now, before the internet, before cell phones, we would, we'd always go to their home and you had a map and a phone booth. If you got lost, yeah, young people, really, there is such a thing, a phone booth. And uh, you'd meet the client, and uh, so this couple called me and asked me to come by their house. And we helped, you know, help locate lost money, get them out of debt. That's what we did back then, pretty much, most of the time. And as I walked in the house, I noticed boxes were packed up, and they said they were moving in a week. And I said, why would you want me to come now if you're moving to Arizona in one week? They said, well, we have some issues we need to talk about. We'd like to get kind of a... Uh, you know, a direction with our finances before we move. I said, sure, okay. So we sat down. As I went through the numbers, they were in serious debt. And it was not a pretty picture, but most of it was medical bills. So I asked about that. And they said, well, our four-year-old was born with a birth defect. And he has to have a feeding tube every day. And his, his digestive system doesn't work, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the little guy, I mean, he, he's walking around. He's not, you know, confined anywhere. He just can't eat. And he has to be fed with a tube and his other issues in, internally. And as we're talking to this couple, he walks in the room. And he walks up to the table where I was talking to the parents. And I had such compassion for them because medical bills, you know, it's just, the situation isn't good, Right. And a cute little guy, he walks up to the table, and the anointing of God kept getting stronger on me. And so now these two, these parents, they were youth pastors at a local church here, and they were moving out to a different church in Arizona. And I said, do you mind if I pray for him? So he's standing right there. So I remember I laid my hands on him and prayed healing over that uh, issue in his stomach and over his body. Such anointing. I felt such an anointing when I prayed, and I remember leaving, and I was supposed to come back the next week and uh, give them some advice on what to do, uh, but as I was leaving, uh, I just couldn't get this little guy in my, my mind. I just, it was such uh, anointing when I prayed with him. Well, for various reasons, they canceled the next meeting. We did it by phone, kind of talked about some things, but six months later, I was sitting in my office, the phone rings, and no one's on the line. And hello, hello, no one's on the line. And then I hear, I hear a woman crying. And finally she says, oh, I'm sorry. She says, uh, I'm sorry. She said, you might remember me. I am the mom of the four-year-old that you laid hands on and prayed. Uh, we are going to Arizona. Do you remember us? I said, oh, yes, yes. I remember praying for your son. I remember meeting you guys. And she started crying a little bit. She goes, listen, she said, I had to call you because... We got out here to Arizona, and there was nothing wrong with my son. He was completely and has been completely healed. 
birth defect is gone. Everything works perfectly. And let me just say this. She was grateful. Last week I said, will you let God use your hands? Remember? That is one of the church's mandates to go lay hands on the sick. Jesus wants to touch a lot of people, and a lot of people are looking for Jesus. Now, grateful. They were grateful. Another time, another story, we were at our house. We had called this company. They were selling, um, Trenda might remind me of exactly what it was, but kind of a... a glass enclosures, like a, a sunroom. And so we saw it at the home show and thought, well, we have these guys come out and just take a look, at, you know, if it would fit, what kind of designs they have. And uh, this guy comes out and brought his little portfolio and he sat down at the kitchen table and he's going through pictures. And as he's talking, all of a sudden, there's that anointing. I'm thinking, wait a minute, something's going on here. It kept getting stronger and stronger. And finally, I think we talked about sunrooms for a little bit, you know. I started talking about the kingdom. And as I began to talk about the Lord, I could see tears welling up in his eyes. And I began to minister to him. And I said, would you like to pray right now and, and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and, and become a citizen of this great, this great kingdom? And he said, yes. So we laid our hands on him. Drenda was there with me. Uh, I prayed, he prayed, amen, right? And he goes, I have got to call my dad. I found out that he is a pastor's son, and he, he, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm a pastor's son, and I am the black sheep of the family. He's about 30-some years old. He said, I've never given my heart. I've rebelled against God my entire life, rebelled against my dad, rebelled against my family. He said, I am the black sheep of the family. And I have got to call my dad. Wow. He dialed his dad, and you could hear his dad screaming. Yes. Can you say grateful? Grateful. grateful. You could hear. <laughs> He could hear him yelling hallelujah and screaming. <laughs> it was awesome. It was a great experience for us and him. And so tonight, will you let God use your voice? The church has been given the commandment to go. Right? To go. So I'm going to read scripture to you. Matthew 18, 12. Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. It's easy to discount people, isn't it? Can you hand me a tissue, Amy, or someone down there? You know, um, it's easy to discount people by maybe what they look like or where they are in life financially or whatever it may be. Maybe by the tattoos or whatever that. Yeah, you know, it may not be your cup of tea, but it's, it's easy to discount people, isn't it? And just walk, by, just walk by them. Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hills and go out to search for the one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than over the 99 that did not wander away. In the same way, it is not my heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. Now, that is God's will. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus for us. Well, how do people hear, right? I mean, how do they hear? Romans 10 11 says, as Scripture says, anyone who believes in him shall never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. 
For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. What would that be if that was your son that was healed? Or maybe you've lost your child in the, in the fairground or in the crowd. And you know what that feels like. What, what would happen if, how grateful would you be if someone found your son or your daughter and restored them or brought the healing power of Jesus to their life to a birth defect? That's a creative miracle. People are wanting to be touched by Jesus. They need to know about Jesus. But Matthew 16, let's turn there. Not Matthew 16, Luke 16, excuse me. This is the parable. This, I share this parable not with an, an intent to make anyone feel guilty or condemned. But Jesus taught this parable. And so we want to make sure we read it. The parable of the shrewd manager. There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. Disqualified. If you can be disqualified, you can be qualified. All right. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig ditches or I'm not, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm ashamed to beg. I, I know what I'll do, he said. When I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. He had a plan. So he called his master's debtors who owed his company money. And he asked the first one, how much do you owe my master? Uh, 800 gallons of olive oil, he said. The manager said, take your bill, sit down quickly before I'm actually walking out at five o'clock and make it 400. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he said. Great, say, take your bill, make it 800. Now the master commended this dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. He had acted shrewdly. Let me just paraphrase what actually happened here. This guy could care less about the master. Is that right? He's already being disqualified because he's using the master's money, not for the gain profit of the master, he's using it on himself. Now when he's losing his job, he puts his plan together to even yet dishonor his master and steal. He has no concern for the master. He likes his position, but he does not really love the master or is he, he's not even concerned about the master's profit, is he? Right? Yet the master said, let me commend you for acting shrewdly, meaning that you had the capacity to create a profit, to interact in business, to work on my behalf for my profit all along. You just proved to me that you can come up with a plan to profit. I had given you that assignment and you failed at it and could care less, but you have now proven to me that you actually have the capacity to do that, right? And it goes on and says some mighty powerful words. You know, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, that's money here. And you've not been trustworthy handling someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? So, 
you have to ask yourself where your heart's at. That's why he told it. The Pharisees, Sadducees were exactly like this. It was a money-making religious act. They didn't really care about God. They cared about their, their position, that people saw them, that people heard them praying, that they looked religious. But they really didn't. In fact, Jesus said these people, their hearts are far from me. They really didn't have God's heart for the people. Didn't really have it. So as we said earlier, I mentioned this searching for the silver coin. A lot of you jumped up and began to look around. Because in your mind, you had the potential of profit. You knew if you found the coin, you'd have profit, you'd have a silver coin, you'd have roughly $28 worth of silver, and you jumped up. But do you respond that way with God's heart towards people? Do you inconvenience yourself to touch people for God? Is your heart... It's not an action. I'm not looking for religious action. That's not, it's not a formula. It's heart. Do you have a heart for people that you want to see them healed, see them come into the kingdom, see them delivered, touch them with the power of God? You want them to know about the kingdom and the benefits of the kingdom. You love God and you love people just like he does. Now, it's not a question that's easy to answer. Life is busy. But we need to mention this. In Hebrews chapter 6, there are the foundational parts of our walk that we are talking about. One of them is eternal judgment. Now, in April of this year, I taught a whole series on life and death. And you can get that series. It goes into great detail, what heaven's like, what hell's like, how, you know, all the things in between. Uh, the, diff the judgments and all of these things. But the point I want to make here is I'm not going to cover all of that. Obviously, we know the Bible says when a man dies, a woman dies, you know, there's judgment. And of course, as believers, we don't fear judgment because we stand before Christ, the judgment seat of Christ, which is for rewards and recognition of what we did for Christ. Unbelievers, of course, are at the white throne judgment. But we as believers... We, we don't have fear of judgment. We're not being judged for heaven or hell. We are being judged, but for our works, our works on behalf of Jesus. Remember he said, you know, if you even give a cup of cold water to this little one, you'll not lose your reward. Okay, so I'm not gonna cover that, but you do need to understand that. What I wanna cover though with this is eternal judgment. Now, right now we face a very tragic situation down through our, southern states, eastern states. And I'll be talking about that in just a little bit, but we see tragedy, we see calamity, we see deaths, we see uh, people without necessities. I mean, it's tragic what's happened there and, and people are pouring money into that and they should. But that's not eternal. Yes, that is a calamity, that is a problem, that is an issue, that's horrible, but that is not eternal. We're talking about people going to hell eternally. And hell is a whole lot worse than a river flooding your house off its foundation. Right? You have to have a worldview of eternity, friend, and understand we're not here forever, you know? We, we live our life, but, you know, there, there's a point in time when we will die and stand before Christ. And this is not to put fear or condemnation in you. I'm trying to help you understand. Jesus taught us these things. And Paul, whoever wrote Hebrews, we don't know actually who wrote it, is mentioning these are foundational points. Now, Acts, the fourth chapter, verse 12 says, salvation is found in no one else. For there was no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. 
See, we've taught this so many times here at Faith Life. It doesn't matter how good or bad you are. It has nothing to do with you going to heaven or hell. When Adam sinned, the whole lineage, Adam's whole lineage, and we're a part of that lineage, let me say it this way, all of mankind came under that judgment. Man lost his position in the kingdom of God and came under Satan's legal jurisdiction. Satan is headed towards hell. And if you're on his team, he's gonna drag everyone with him. It is a legal issue, totally 100%, a legal issue. That's why your salvation is a legal issue. Jesus redeemed you, that's a legal issue. He paid the price, he took Adam's place. The penalty of sin was death. And if someone who is innocent would take Adam's place, then mankind could be freed from Satan's jurisdiction. But there wasn't anyone that was not under Satan's jurisdiction. All of mankind had been tainted by sin. That is why Jesus had to come through a different lineage by a virgin, Mary, than Adam. And willingly, without sin, offered his life in place of Adam's. And when he did that, it made it legal for mankind to escape the judgment that is coming. But you must ratify it, meaning that God cannot make you do anything. You must personally say, I'll receive that. Whoever calls on the name of Jesus has that legal right to escape that judgment. Here's, here's the part people have to understand. The friendly person who has not called on the name of Jesus, we always think hell will be full of murderers and all. No, this is a legal, if you have not called on the name of Jesus and put yourself in alignment with what his, he sacrificed for you and said, called on the name of Jesus for that, ratify what he did for you. That's God's escape plan. And so the next time you're sitting next to someone that's nice, and you think, oh, they're a nice person, but are they going to heaven? Where, where are they going eternally? This is, Hebrews 6 is eternal judgment. I want that to sink in. I know we can't fathom that. The best way I know to think of it is look at the, the, the stars. You know, NASA has these pictures when they put the Hubble Space uh, Telescope in the sky. You know, our earthbound telescopes could see galaxies, right? And they saw thousands of them. When they put Hubble up there, all of a sudden they saw thousands more. And when they put, what's the, the last telescope called? I can't remember. Well, you know, they sent another one up, right? The bigger one? Yes. Not the Hubble, but James, James Webb? Yeah, and it sees like so much further. And they thought they would see the end you know, they thought they'd run out of galaxies, right? And then they put that on the same spot where the Hubble saw 5,000 galaxies in a, like a grain of sand at arm's length, 5,000 galaxies. They put the bigger telescope on that same grain of sand spot, and now it's 10,000 galaxies. They could not see the end, and they were surprised because young galaxies are not fully formed. They're kind of this you know, disorientated kind of blob of stars, they were shocked that 10,000 galaxies, quote, 13 billion, they can see 13 billion year, light years away, perfectly formed galaxies. How can that be? It can't be possible. And if they would develop a telescope that sees three million times farther than that, they're gonna see what? More galaxies. That's what eternity kind of feels like. We can't conceive of it, but we, we can see it and not conceive of it. We can see it, you know, our body, how, I mean, we all found ourselves here. None of us decided to come here or to build our own body to walk in the earth with, right? I mean, we're like, you know, we just take this stuff for granted, right? That everything works and it's just how everything works here on the earth and blue sky, green grass, beautiful flowers. I mean, birds that sing pretty, not evil, you know, and just Aren't you glad birds don't sing an evil tune? I just like that. <laughs> God did that, you know? But have you ever stopped and just thought about that? The reality is 
eternity is real. And God wanted you with him. But he wants your neighbor there as well. He wants your neighbor there as well. So I said, will you let him use your hands? Will you let him use your voice? I'm not talking about a religious, abrupt type of pounding people. God will direct your steps. You'll know. You can give a witness, you know. Tell someone your story. Interesting. But as we go through these foundational principles, you know, the thing that stuck out to me is eternal. Once it's set, it's set, set. Can, can you conceive of that? It's, it's amazing. But if you truly had a concept of that, would you reach out and touch or share, knowing that you are, well, the Bible says God gets excited about it because he doesn't want one. So it says he doesn't want to miss one, one. He says, don't look down on them. Don't judge them. They're angels are before the Lord. They're God's creation. And then he goes on, someone loses a sheep. They're going to drop everything. Kind of like you guys did. You just got up and started looking for a silver coin. They're going to drop everything else. They're going to drop everything else. And the priority, the priority then is to find that lost sheep. Find that lost coin. That is the priority. Everyone else is safe, right? That's what Jesus wants to do.